when things collide with each other, like say when this blue coin hits this uh, white coin, we see that their speeds change after collision. If you look at it one more time, notice before the collision, the blue coin was faster than that white coin. Here I've shown the picture of this before collision, but notice what happens after collision. The white coin becomes faster than the blue coin. Again, here is the picture of this after collision. But what's interesting is that even though their speeds have changed after collision, their momentum stays conserved. What we mean by that is if you calculate its total initial momentum of these two coins before the collision, that will equal its total momentum after the collision. And the goal of this video is to try and prove that. We'll mathematically prove this statement. And before we do that, if you're not familiar with this concept, then we've talked a lot about this with few examples in a previous video called Conservation of Momentum. So it would be a great idea to go back and watch that and then come back over here. Anyways, if you are ready, then let's go ahead and prove this. Whenever we want to prove something, the first obvious question we might have is where do we start? We can start by trying to write this mathematically. What do we mean by total initial momentum? Well, remember momentum is, the, is just mass into velocity. So total initial momentum would be mass into velocity of this coin before the collision plus mass into velocity of this coin. And total final momentum would be again the same thing after collision. So since there will be masses and velocities, let's first go ahead and give names to them. So let's say this blue coin, let me call that as coin number one, and let's call its mass as M1. Similarly, let's say the white coin is coin number two, and let's call its mass as M2. And because their velocities are changing, let's name that as well. Let's say that the initial velocity of that first coin is u1 before the collision, and after the collision it becomes v1. And similarly for the white coin, before the collision, let's say its initial velocity is u2, and after the collision, let's say it becomes v2. Okay, so the first thing we'll have to do now is write this equation, what we need to prove mathematically in terms of m1, u1, and everything. And you know what will make this derivation great? If we can do it together. So in between, you may have to pause and try some steps yourself. So it'll be nice if you could have a pen or a pencil and a paper with you. All right, so our first step is to write this statement mathematically. And so, can you try that yourself first? See if you can write this statement using these, um, uh, these terms mathematically first. Go ahead, pause the video and give this a try. All right, so total initial momentum would be the mass into initial velocity of the first coin, that's going to be m1 u1, plus mass into initial velocity of the second coin, that's going to be m2 u2, total initial. And that will be equal to mass into final velocity of the first coin, that is m1 v1, plus mass into final velocity of V2. So this is what we need to prove. Awesome. Next question we might have is how to prove that? Where do we start? Well, in any derivation, to figure out how to start, we need to know what concept needs to be applied over there. So what concepts need to be applied for momentum conservation? Turns out, that momentum conservation actually comes from Newton's third law. And so for me, this is the most important step in the derivation. If we remember that Newton's third law is responsible for momentum conservation, then we can start and we can derive everything. So let's see how. What does Newton's third law say? It says that for every action there's equal and opposite reaction. And these action and reaction are forces, right? So where does force come into the picture over here? Ah, during collision. When the blue coin goes and hits this white coin, it pushes that, it puts a force on that. So the secret to deriving this is to look at the collision. All right, so let's look at the collision instance. So let's say the blue coin hits the white coin this way and puts a force on it. And we'll give a name to that as well. Let's call that as F2. But at the same time, two will push back on one. 
And so there'll be a force on our first coin as well. And let's call that force F1. Now what's Newton's third law telling us? It's saying that F1 must be equal and opposite to F2. And so that's where we can start. So again, great idea to pause the video and see if you can write this statement that F1 is equal and opposite to F2 mathematically, because that's the starting point. Again, give this a shot. All right. So F1 is equal and opposite to F2. So we can write this as F1 is equal and opposite. How do we write opposite? Well, mathematically, we usually write opposite as negative. So it'll be negative F2. Okay, what next? Well, we have an equation with force, but I want to bring mass and velocity into the picture. So can we think of any connection between forces and masses and velocities? I'm pretty sure you know this one. Newton's second law, one of the most famous equations in physics, F equals ma. So we can write Newton's second law for both these forces. We can substitute that. So if we do that, F1, we can write that equals M1 times A1. That's for the first, um, first coin. And similarly, for F2, we can write it is equal to M2 times A2. So we have brought in the mass into the picture. We're slowly coming there, that's nice. But what we don't want is acceleration. I don't want A and I want velocities. So the next thing we can think is, is there a connection between acceleration and velocity. And I think you know that. Acceleration is rate of change of velocity, isn't it? So again, great idea to pause the video and see if you can substitute for A1 and A2 in terms of velocities. Again, give it a try. Pause the video and give this a try. Okay, hopefully you tried. So we'll get M1 times A1 is the rate of change of velocity of the first coin. So to concentrate better, let's dim the white coin. So we will get, we will get rate of change of velocity of the first coin, which is final velocity minus the initial velocity. That's the change. And rate of change means you have to divide by time. And so let's say that time is T. That T is the time it took for this blue coin to go from initial to final. And if you're wondering why I'm writing T and not T1, I'll come back to that a little bit later. Anyways, that will be equal to negative M2 times, now to calculate A2, let's dim the blue ones, the blue coin. Okay, so that will be equal to M2 times A2, which is final minus initial, that's V2 minus U2 divided by time T. So why am I writing time T both? Why not T1 and T2? Well, the reason is these two times are exactly the same. I mean, again, if we bring everything back, this time is the time it takes for them to change their velocity, right? And when are they changing their velocities? It's during the collision, right? It's during the collision forces act on them and they change their velocity. So this time is actually the collision time but collision time, it must be the same for both of them, right? I mean, if one is in contact with two for let's say five milliseconds, then two will also be in contact with one for exactly that same time, five milliseconds. And so that's why the times must be the same. And so that means we can cancel them. And now look, we have brought in everything that we wanted into the picture. We have masses and we have initial and the final velocities, which means, which means the physics is done. Now all we have to do is algebra and we'll get this. And again, good time to pause the video and see if you can do the rest of the derivation and get what we want. Go ahead, pause the video and try. All right, so final steps. All we have to do is just simplify that little bit of algebra. So if we open the brackets, we'll get M1 V1 minus M1 U1 equals if you open the brackets here, now be a little bit careful with the signs, we'll get negative M2V2, negative M2V2, and we'll get negative M2 into negative U2, that becomes plus, right? And minus times minus is plus, so that'll get plus M2U2. And 
all we have to do now is rearrange this equation such that all the u terms are on one side and all the v terms are on the other side. And I'm pretty sure you can do that. And if we do that, we get what we want. And there we have it. So we have derived what we wanted. We found that the total final momentum should equal total initial momentum. And so just to quickly summarize, how did we do this derivation? Well, we first wrote what we wanted in a mathematical form because we are deriving mathematically. Then we asked ourselves, what concept do we have to apply, which is the most important step in our derivation, and that is the Newton's third law. Once we understood that, we started with Newton's third law in the mathematical form, and we just kept substituting, and then we did some algebra, and we derived this.